Hello and uh, welcome to this hydrogen and low CO2 iron and steel making webinar. This is the second webinar in a series of three on this topic. And I am Anna Voss and I am with AIST. And this webinar is going to focus on hydrogen production, storage, and safe handling. So as with all AIST functions, we need to go through both our antitrust guidelines and our anti-harassment policy. If I can get my slides to move forward. There we go. So the antitrust guidelines are do not discuss with yours or others or competitors pricing, pricing procedures, or anything that might affect prices such as cost, discount, terms of sales, or profit margins, or anticipated wage rates. Do not make statements about your own prices or those of competitors. Do not talk about what individual companies plan to do in particular markets or with particular customers. Do not disclose to others any competitively sensitive information. Do not propose or agree to any action intended to disadvantage or injure another company. Do not stay at a meeting or activity where any such anti-competitive talks occur. And then our anti-harassment policy is that the Association for Iron and Steel Technology is dedicated to providing a harassment-free environment for everyone, regardless of age, race, religion, disability, gender, gender identity, or sexual orientation. We do not tolerate harassment in any form of anyone attending an AIST event. Harassing behaviors include offensive verbal comments related to age, race, religion, disability, gender, gender identity, or sexual orientation. The use or display of sexual images, activities, or commentary in public spaces, deliberate intimidation, stalking, or following, harassing photography or recording, sustained disruption of events, or inappropriate physical contact. Participants asked to stop any harassing behaviors are expected to comply immediately. Participants violating this policy may be sanctioned or expelled from the event or the membership at the discretion of the AIST leadership. I have a few notes for all of you as attendees. Right now, your attendee audio has been disabled. So if you would like to communicate any questions to um, myself, our moderators, or the panelists, please use the question and answer feature um, that you can see whenever you move your mouse around on your screen, the menu will pop up and you should be able to see the Q&A feature. Uh, the host and the moderator, myself and the moderators will, um, mon will keep an eye on those Q&As that come in and present them to the panelists when they're done with their presentations in a group question and answer session at the, at the end of the webinar. Also, this session is being recorded. And if you have any technical difficulties, feel free to email training at AIST.org and we'll do our best to help you out. So with that, I would like to introduce our two moderators. So we have Chris Pistorius, who is the POSCO professor for material science and engineering. And he's the co-director of the Center for Iron and Steelmaking Research at Carnegie Mellon University, as well as Zane Voss, who is a metallurgist with CIX LLC. I also forgot to mention that this webinar is um, produced by our Direct Reduced Iron Technology Committee. Chris Pistorius is currently the chair of that committee and Zane is the education chair of that committee. So with that, I'm gonna turn the rest of the webinar over to the two of them. Um, and Zane, if you would like to introduce our panelists, it's all yours. All right, thank you, Anna. Good morning, everyone. So I wanted to uh, echo Anna's welcome um, on behalf of the DRI Technology Committee. We're glad to have you all here. Uh, we're very excited about this, this webinar. It should be a very, very interesting discussion. Uh, so so the, there's been a lot of interest in lately, you know, within the last decade or so on, on the decarbonization of the steel industry and particularly iron making. Uh, we had a previous webinar that was focused around iron making technologies using hydrogen or other methods for achieving low CO2 iron and steel production. Um, but one, one fundamental uh, thing in common that these technologies have is that they all require the wide and easy availability of hydrogen or, or some other material as, a, as an alternative reductant uh, to lower the CO2 burden of the process. Um, so 
we had this uh, this idea for this webinar series to kind of educate the AST membership and anyone else in the steel industry that uh, that may be interested uh, on the, the technologies available. Like I said, both for the production itself of iron, but also the, the generation of hydrogen as an alternative reductant. So we've got uh, an excellent lineup of speakers today. Uh, we'll have three presentations, starting with Manish Shah. He is a Lindy Fellow and works in the Hydrogen, Syngas, and Petrochemicals R&D Group. Uh, we also have Alexander Schriefel, who is the Lurgy Technologies Director at Ehrlichie Global ENC Solutions. And then we'll cap it off with Stuart Stewart, who is the Chief Commercial Officer for Biotech Inc. So we'll, uh, we'll have these three presentations and then following that, we will have an, um, an open Q&A session that is led by Dr. Pistorius. So with that, I am going to hand things over to Manish and let him pull up his presentation and... Uh... Thank you, Zain. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, greetings from uh, Linde Technology Center in Buffalo, New York. I would like to thank AIEST for opportunity to give a talk on hydrogen production for decarbonization of iron making. In this presentation, I will cover hydrogen production process and Linde's portfolio of technologies for both conventional and clean hydrogen production, and also share a perspective on how we can decarbonize time making processes. Just a brief overview of uh, different options for conventional as well as clean hydrogen production. Uh, steam methane reforming is a current method and it's a workhorse of the industry uh, today. Uh, natural gas is most commonly used feedstock for this technology. Uh, this technology is very mature, efficient, and reliable, and industry continue to push the single train capacity uh, in the range that may be uh, you know, a good fit for the iron making processes. Uh, currently, when you uh, make hydrogen from natural gas, all the carbon that's in natural gas is converted to carbon dioxide, and it's emitted to the atmosphere. Uh, we also refer to this uh, conventional hydrogen as a gray hydrogen. Some people refer to it as a brown hydrogen. Uh, now, if you use this hydrogen in iron making process, uh, the CO2 emissions are basically shifted from iron making to the hydrogen plant. And overall emissions, whether you use natural gas for, let's say, DRI versus hydrogen, if you draw envelope around the two facilities, the emissions may be similar. So if your objective really is to decarbonize uh, iron making process, uh, we need to look for cleaner hydrogen uh, production methods. And I'm highlighting two of those options here. One is you st still start with natural gas as your feedstock, but then capture CO2 from your SMR or hydrogen plant uh, and uh, generate what we call blue hydrogen. Uh, this technology would be suitable for retrofitting existing plants, as well as in the transition period until uh, even more cleaner uh, options are available. And uh, the ultimate long-term solution for making clean hydrogen is likely to be uh, based on renewable energy as a uh, feedstock for a hydrogen production. As an example, you can use renewable power in the electrolysis and make uh, clean hydrogen and there is no CO2 emitted anywhere in your value chain and you can make uh, clean hydrogen. Other options are obviously you can start with biomass or biogas and also end up with the green hydrogen. So now I will briefly review the hydrogen uh, pro production process that we use today. Uh, the natural gas is first treated to remove any sulfur compounds that are present in the ga natural gas. Uh, then it's mixed with steam and fed to uh, a steam methane reformer furnace. 
uh, we supply this uh, steam natural gas mixture uh, into catalyst tubes within this furnace. Uh, these tubes are heated from outside by firing uh, fuel. Uh, this, this is the heart of the hydrogen production process. In the catalyst tube, you have reaction between natural gas and steam, and you produce a syngas comprising of uh, hydrogen and carbon monoxide. The syngas is then uh, passed on to shift reactor where you convert CO uh, by shift reaction with uh, steam to generate additional hydrogen. Uh, and then uh, finally you take the syngas into a purification process. Uh, we use hydrogen PSA, which is a pressure swing adsorption uh, to produce pure hydrogen. And tail gas uh, from the PSA unit is uh, used as a fuel along with uh, uh, makeup natural gas. Now, as you can see, I'm not going to go through all the heat integration here, but the flue gas and the process gas streams go through extensive thermal energy recovery so that uh, we have very efficient process. Uh, in some cases, we need a final product compressor depending on the end use to raise the pressure uh, uh, even higher. This slide shows uh, some uh, plant, uh, major plant sections. So on the upper left, you see here uh, is what we refer to as a reformer island. Uh, this rectangular box on the right side of this picture is the radiant section of the reformer, which contains anywhere from 300 to 500 catalyst filled tubes, which are 40 to 45 feet tall, four to five inch in diameter. We also have 100 uh, or so burners in this furnace. And on the left side of this box is the uh, thermal energy recovery section or the convective section of the reformer island. It includes the boilers, both on the process gas side as well as the flue gas side. Now this 3D diagram on the right, uh, you see is the structure for the process gas cooling section as well as the shift reactor and the desulfurization reactors. And picture on the upper right is uh, pressure swing adsorption unit. Uh, usually it's a multi uh, vessel unit, you know, anywhere from six to 12 uh, vessels filled with adsorbents, which allows you to recover and uh, remove all the non-hydrogen components uh, from the syngas so that you can uh, end up with the pure hydrogen. Now this slide shows a portfolio of products we have starting from low end at 300 normal meter cube per hour, completely containerized uh, for easy site installation, fully automatic, uh, designed for unattended operation. Uh, we call it Hydro Prime Me. Uh, the next stop uh, from there is the Hydro Prime Me uh, product. And this one is uh, uh, goes from anywhere from 1,000 to 16,000 meter cube per hour. Uh, signature piece of equipment in this uh, uh, product is this uh, cylindrical can shape reformer. And with the twin can, as you see here, uh, we can push the production rate up to 16,000 uh, meter cube per hour. Again, a lot of standardized modules uh, for uh, uh, easy installation and uh, keeping the construction schedule short. Once you go above this range, uh, we go into uh, rectangular box reformers. Uh, the first one up is the Hydro Prime Max series, which goes up to 32,000 meter cube per hour, uh, sorry, uh, capacity. Uh, this one is a new design. Uh, we recently uh, are commercializing uh, heavily standardized components and uh, heavily standardized modules which allows us to keep the construction schedule uh, less than six months. Uh, and then once you are above this range, uh, we go into this high comp range, which goes all the way up to 200,000 meter cube per hour. Uh, again, we use compact plant design concept. And in this case, we use standardized plant modules. Uh, we have a lot of experience. You know, We have more than 100 plants in operation uh, that uh, Linde operates. Uh, we also do a lot of uh, third-party sales, 
and uh, we have experience uh, in up to 300 plants. You know whether it, the scope could be E and EP, with, which is engineering and procurement, or we can also have turnkey lump sum uh, uh, contract for supplying this. Just a uh, just an overview slide for uh, storage and distribution. Now, most of the hydrogen we produce is produced on the customer side. So the hydrogen is produced and supplied over the fence to customer and customer just consumes right away. We do have some customers who are right, not right uh, next door to our plant. Uh, if they are small customers, we supply with uh, what we call tube trailer on the uh, with the trucks, you know, up to 300 kg per truck. We also have liquefier, uh, liquefaction plants where we store liquid hydrogen, as you can see in this spherical tank, and then we truck uh, liquid in the trucks uh, with uh, four to 5,000 kg per truck. We also have extensive pipeline systems in various geographies in the world. The largest one being in the US Gulf Coast. Uh, you can see the map here. Uh, this is where we have largest concentration of large hydrogen plants. Uh, you can see some red stars here. And on this pipeline, we have this unique storage system, uh, underground storage. This is uh, similar to uh, natural gas uh, storage that you, a lot of you may be familiar with. Uh, but in this case, we store pure hydrogen. Uh, and then this allows us to achieve unprecedented reliability in this enclave of uh, hydrogen plants. Uh, the working capacity of this storage cavern is uh, 40 million meter cube, uh, normal meter cube. So what it does is uh, whenever we have downtime in any one of plants uh, on this enclave, uh, we are able to supply the customers uh, from this uh, cavern uh, and it backs up uh, one of the large plants up to 14 days. Now let's look at some of the clean hydrogen options. Uh, first, uh, the hydrogen production with CO2 capture. This is the same uh, process uh, scheme I showed earlier. Uh, we have a lot of options uh, in different uh, locations within the hydrogen plant. Uh, we can capture CO2 from syngas uh, using amine unit or CO2 PSA. We can uh, capture CO2 from the tail gas of the PSA or we can capture from the flue gas. Now you can see the different uh, capture rate at different locations. The reason you have lower capture rate in these two locations is not all the carbon has been transformed into carbon dioxide by this point in the process. And so whatever is available, we are able to capture. And obviously in the flue gas, in the stack, you have all the carbon available for capture as CO2, and we can capture up to 90%. We do have uh, technologies available for all these options I mentioned. Uh, on the left side, uh, the CO2 PSAs for syngas and the tail gas, you see some pictures of the actual plants. On the right hand side, you see amine units, uh, one for syngas. Now we, in the syngas side, we have a lot of experience because in the plants where we make hydrogen and carbon monoxide together, we have to have amine unit to separate CO2 before we purify carbon monoxide. And we have built uh, more than 50 commercial units uh, in this, uh, uh, this type of uh, separation. For the flue gas, uh, we are uh, scaling up the technology uh, that we jointly developed with BASF based on their OAS, OAS Blue solvent, uh, where BASF provides the solvent in the process and Linde's scope is usually EPC as well as operation. We have done the 30 tons per day demonstration at a National Carbon Capture Center in the United States. We are planning a larger scale demo as well as uh, to improve the cost uh, uh, position on this uh, technology. But we are also at the same time exploring to go full commercial right away. And we have some designs available for very large scale uh, CO2 capture uh, from flue gas streams, not only from hydrogen plant, also from many other uh, flue gas sources from different industries. Uh, as far as clean hydrogen goes, uh, we 
established a joint venture with ITM Power last year uh, called ITM Linde Electrolysis. Uh, currently, we can supply anywhere from 10 megawatt to 100 megawatt plants. Uh, for 10 megawatt, uh, we modules uh, we bundle uh, or we gang together two megawatt cubes and make 10 megawatt modules, and then we can bundle those together to go up to 100 megawatt plant. To give an idea of how this compares uh, with a uh, current uh, large reformers, uh, this 10, 100 megawatt plants would produce 17 million cubic feet per day hydrogen, uh, which if I convert the units into meter cube per hour is roughly 19,000 meter cube per hour. And our largest reformer goes up to 200,000 meter cube per hour. So we need a gigawatt gigawatt scale electrolysis plant to match the current largest uh, reformer. And uh, our plan is to get there uh, within next 10 years. So there is a plan to scale up the manufacturing capacity for electrolysis and get there in the end, by end of the next decade. Now, some uh, technologies that we have supplied, we currently supply to iron making processes. Uh, we have supplied a lot of coke oven gas PSAs to uh, produce pure hydrogen from a stream that usually contains about 50% hydrogen and a lot of other impurities. Uh, we can produce pure hydrogen from this stream. Uh, the current capacities uh, range from 3,000 to 20,000 meter cube per hour. Uh, we also are testing an improved uh, process and doing a pilot uh, in Germany here. Uh, you can see a picture on the right. We have also supplied CO2 recovery units for uh, several steel plants uh, or iron making plants. The picture on the right here, you see here, it's an amine unit uh, from DRI top gas. And I'm sure you are familiar with this schematic. Uh, where you can take the top gas, uh, remove CO2, and then recycle, uh, and then mix with uh, fresh syn gas uh, so that uh, your reducing gas supplied to DRI is a high calorific value. Uh, this was based on the BASF OS uh, white technology. Uh, the Linde did the EPC. Uh, the syn gas capacity in this case was uh, 300,000 normal metric cube per hour. We have also supplied a PSA unit uh, for the similar application. And we have one of the largest uh, PSA unit. You can see the picture on the lower right here. Uh, capacity here was 500,000 meter cube per hour of uh, re reduction gas as a product from this uh, PSA. So, you know, uh, in the iron making process, uh, there is a way to decarbonize as well as uh, integrating some of the hydrogen recovery technologies to supply hydrogen for any other use within the steel making process. So just some, uh, this is my final slide, just sharing some perspective on how we can decarbonize. As I mentioned earlier, if we use uh, conventional hydrogen from SMR for DRI, it's going to shift CO2 emission to the hydrogen plant. And so if you use this option, uh, the question then is, uh, is the additional cost of hydrogen, you know, can you justify that by additional value that you may have in the DRI process by substituting natural gas with hydrogen? Now, if the decarbonization is desired, then the question should be answered whether you want to capture CO2 directly from a hydrogen plant or use natural gas in the iron making process and then capture CO2 from the iron making process. And so we have to evaluate the overall cost benefit of these two approaches and see which one is the better option. And in any of these options, when you want to capture CO2, you need a plan for CO2. Uh, you need option for either sequestration, enhanced oil recovery, or any other uses uh, for carbon dioxide, which allows you to then dispose of that CO2. And one of the application that I heard of, uh, heard of is uh, 
carbonization of steel slag and this is the way you can uh, fix the carbon and then use that uh, for some other uh, applications as a material uh, in the building. Uh, if, now ultimately in the long term, the hydrogen from electrolysis using renewable energy or making hydrogen from any bio-based uh, sources uh, could be a good long-term solution uh, which will not require any uh, CO2 capture. And finally, what I would uh, point out is in any of these hydrogen production options, there may be some integration opportunity available between the hydrogen supply technology and iron making processes, and that should be fully exploited by working together uh, with industrial gas suppliers. And those should be fully considered in all the options. So with that, I will end my presentation and I'll be happy to answer questions at the end of this, uh, uh, all the talks. Thank you. All right, thank you, Manish, for an excellent presentation. I appreciate it. Uh, if you could stop sharing your screen, we will, uh, thank you. We will move on to Alexander Schriefel and I will uh, let him go ahead with his presentation. Hello, so this works now. We made all the tests last week. <laughs> Okay, screen sound is okay. Yes. Good. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, yes, um, Alexander Schriffel, my name. I come from Air Liquide, um, engineering construction um, uh, division, if you want to call it. So we take care about engineering uh, construction of the process plants, but also we, have, we hold technologies and we host technologies. And that's also what is my responsibility. I host a group of technos we call Lurgi Technologies, which in principle deals with uh, production of uh, gases, plus something less additional ones like chemicals, but I'm here specifically now for the production of hydrogen and more specifically by water electrolysis. So thanks again also from my side from AIST for um, giving me the opportunity to speak to all of you. Um, I want to do with you a quick overview. Uh, of course, I need to run some of, I will run quickly to some of the corporate slides where we stand, but this is a quick introduction. Um, I will focus uh, today really only on the electrolysis parts in terms of um, what's the principles, what kind of different technos do we have, some rule of thumbs of KPIs, also give an outlook where the industry needs to move in this regard so we to make electrolysis really a player. Um, what kind of integration applications do we have? And of course, also what Elikid is doing in this regard. Let's start with a safety moment. Um, as you know, we are, we are dealing here with hydrogen and oxygen uh, together at the same time from the same process plant, from the same production plant. Um, one needs to take care of, uh, of these uh, explosion limits in the, in the, in the plant itself. Um, message here is it's not a simple thing, but we know it. We know hydrogen, we know oxygen. Elikid produces oxygen. But just to put it here in the beginning, an electrolyzer plant has, has certain specifics from design point of view and from detection point of view. We, we know to deal with it though. So Elikid Group is, uh, is also an industrial gas player. Uh, you, you might uh, hopefully have heard of it. So we are in, in, the, in the field of the production of gases small molecules, as you also want to call it. And of course, the, the historic and major business today is still oxygen. Um, so we do oxygen production on site in bottles uh, for different applications for industry, for steel industry, of course, uh, as a big customer base, um, but also for smaller consumers, electronic markets, healthcare markets. Hydrogen is also a molecule which we produce and sell. Um, and um, we come to an example where we do that also with um, electrolysis. So as I said, I'm from the engineering construction division. So we host technologies uh, which we put to good use uh, um, out of several locations. So we are totally 15, 15 engineering centers. We also have a front end office in, uh, in Houston, by the way. I'm speaking now from Frankfurt, um, but we have colleagues also sitting in Houston. Um, Elikid is a group, but also EMC. And, um, 
And uh, we do that, as I said, uh, for ourselves. So we invest in our own technos, we run them, we get uh, operational experience, which we can then leverage and capitalize from. And we also, of course, do this for customers who want to order a plant installation from us and then um, would operate it themselves. I would say from my point of view, from EMC point of view, it's roughly 50-50, these kind of activities in terms of engineering for in-house or for outhouse. And we have a, as I said, we have a really big ambition to also make this um, as a technology independent. So hydrogen is a, is a key molecule, as I said, uh, and for various reasons. Uh, it has a very, um, as an initial really said in the beginning, uh, in the first presentation, a very a traditional role uh, in the chemistry market, in the refining market uh, for ammonia. Um, and that's an existing role we clearly see will continue, of course. Um, and there, the objective is how can we do that with less CO2 produced in the process? So with less CO2 footprint. So we come to the concepts as we have seen earlier from gray hydrogen to blue hydrogen to green hydrogen to use it for, the, for this, uh, let's say, traditional usage. In addition, of course, we see new markets where we want to replace uh, current, uh, let's say, energy carriers or fossil fuels mainly with hydrogen, with the idea that the footprint of those fossil fuels, the CO2 footprint of those fossil fuels is uh, mitigated or disappears in the best case. And in addition, we can use hydrogen and the best case then, of course, also from blue or green hydrogen. So we have the best of both worlds. And uh, this is really a key lever to, um, to contribute to the overall decarbonization of the, of the industry. So if you look at some of the, of the papers published in the last two, three years, so in this case, that's from the Hydrogen Council. Um, if you look at the projections, yeah, so on the x-axis you see here from today until 2050, a uh, big increase projected in hydrogen demand uh, for various parts in the industrial application um, here is, is uh, plays quite a role, not the only one. DRI steel, of course, also already a big chunk. Transportation also a big chunk. I don't want to go into details of these numbers. You can argue around them probably for hours. The idea here is clearly that we see the hydrogen as a, and not only we, I think it's industry uh, or let's say even policy commonality in the meantime, as a real uh, driver and uh, important building block for the decarbonization of industry and also transportation. So uh, what is LEQ doing in this field? So we have a very good position that we, whatever the energy source is, uh, and we, we have seen in the Q&A already talking about biomass, natural gas, of course, a classic one, but here we are also today about talking about power intake and we can convert it to hydrogen. In this case, you see here, uh, value chain towards a fueling station for mobility, but this is not necessarily where it needs to go. It, it can also go to industry use, um, but it's just one building block. The electrolysis is clearly one building block for us also to give overall solutions in blue slash green um, hydrogen delivery. Um, the electrolysis here is with this box, and this box here is mentioned that we are using here not in-house techno, so we are, we are working here in principle on the open market. Uh, you can say we are technology agnostic, and we come to it exactly what this means, um, but we want to integrate, of course. Uh, we want to put it as part of our overall solutions, and also we want to install it and make it then uh, in operation for either ourselves or for you as a potential customer. So that's where, where we see the electrolysis as a uh, part of this um, value chain we want to provide. So let's talk about water electrolysis. Um, you see from this picture that we are talking here about a technology which is not at all considered necessarily high tech. Um, I will ho hopefully convince you maybe at the end of this um, few minutes that it, it still is high tech. It's a very interesting position. Uh, today that it is very old at the same time it has very new aspects at the same time so we have a quite interesting mixture of a long history of applications 100 years plus yeah, uh, and usage and at the same time there's a lot of R&D for new concepts for making it more efficient and of course more cheaper because the cost of production here is still an issue yeah, as, we, as we will see later. So what is it doing? Yeah, it's, it takes water uh, and uh, forces the water to split up 
to hydrogen and oxygen, which are its um, uh, atomic uh, components. And uh, we do this with electric current. Uh, the water will not split up by itself. It needs a little push. And we do this by electric current. Um, and electric current here is the main feedstock, so to speak. So the idea is to use the power. The electric current is a feedstock to produce then hydrogen. And of course, oxygen. Today, we are here mainly for the hydrogen, but let's not forget the oxygen either. And you see from the equation on top that we produce the double of amount in terms of volume uh, in hydrogen than the oxygen, but the nature of the molecule of H2O. Um, so how, how, does this, how does this work? Um, we have, um, we have uh, electrodes which take the current. So we have a cathode and an anode, and they are polarizing. And the reaction happens on the respective negative or positive side. Uh, on the cathode, the hydrogen is produced. And on the anodes, the oxygen is produced. And then, of course, the oxygen, uh, sorry, the electric current, uh, the charge difference needs to be balanced, and we need a charge carrier. And in this case, uh, it's, a, it's an alkaline solution, KOH, uh, potassium, um, uh, yeah, KOH, sorry, hydrogen oxide, but potassium hydrogen oxide. And the hydrogen oxide uh, anion is the charge carrier. So that's a very typical arrangement for uh, alkaline electrolysis. And what you see here also, and remember this now for the rest, is a cell. This is an electrolysis cell, as you see. And in reality, it looks more like this. This is a very thin arrangement um, with a membrane in the middle, with, uh, with the electrodes, also with the catalyst sometimes, from the difference between the different variations. So this is, one elect this is one electrolysis cell. And the electrolysis cell alone, of course, does not make a lot of production. It's, it takes only a, a, a limited current. Um, and uh, mainly determined by the, by the area. And um, it, it, um, it produces also limited uh, amount by the nature. So it needs to be stacked. Uh, and the idea, of course, is, and it will be this quickly, is to, you see here, uh, a series of cells stacked in series. And that's what we call electrolysis stack. And that's, in principle, the core of the electrolysis production. This one takes electric current, it takes the water and produces hydrogen and oxygen. I want to introduce you a few principles. Uh, in total, I will talk about three, but there are two major ones, which I would say are relevant today. And we, I told you already, we have an alkaline solution uh, in circulation, and that's what we call an alkaline type electrolysis, uh, which takes KOH as a, as, a, as a fly, so to speak, which runs in the loop, produces uh, hydrogen and oxygen, and needs to be balanced out with clean water or fresh water from, from, from the system. On the right side, you see a more advanced system, which does not take KOH. It just takes pure um, water, clean water. And it uses a membrane in between. And the, hydro and the carrier of the charge difference here is not the OH minus. It's the H plus. And this is a proton. And that's also why this is called the PEM, a proton exchange membrane type, and this is a more advanced one, and we'll come to it, uh, what's the advantage is here, and it's clearly, and you see it already from the next picture, it's absolutely more compact. Yeah? So the same duty you can do with a big stack uh, on the alkaline side, you can do in a much more compact form um, with a pen type, as you say, and that's clearly one of the advantages and drivers why this is a very interesting option. It does not necessarily mean in all aspects, and we, we come to some pros and cons. But just to introduce you to two basic principles, alkaline type and PEM type. Alkaline type is the older one, hundreds of years old. PEM is more new, let's say 10, 15 years, and, uh, and uh, still is also not, it's also not so mature by the nature of it and not so much referenced at all, not at all. So let's look at a typical arrangement now from a plant point of view. And you see here this light blue in the middle. This is actually where the stack is. So the stack takes the power. And all the rest is, is we call balance of stack and balance of plant. And that's what comprises the electrolysis installation. Uh, and you need all that. No? So the actual core, the heart, is, is very small. And it's really by far the smallest also in real footprint. Um, and, uh, and the rest makes all the management of the electrical current. You have transformers, of course, you have switch gears, yeah, you need rectifiers because it can only work with direct current. And the grids usually comes with AC. So it needs to be trans transformed. You need to have the voltage down. 
Then you have to manage the water, the liquids, the light, and the KOH if you have an alkaline type, cooling system, and of course the gases which come out, in this case hydrogen, you have a deoxo plant that remove residual oxygen, you have dryers, and then you have your product, if you look at the more um, block flow type point of view, it looks more like this. Um, so again, same principle, electrolysis in the middle, the stack is in the middle, and you have uh, gas production left and right, separation, uh, liquid is collected and goes in circles and gas and products go out after some additional cleaning and maybe here you see also intermediate storage. So it's a typical arrangement here just to give you a feel on the size of it and we come to some, we come to some footprint um, comparisons later. So really the majority of the footprint of the installation is the managing of the actual stack itself in terms of electrical gases and liquids. So from a project management point of view, it looks more like this. So again, it's a similar picture. We have in the middle the green one, the stack. Yeah, the the DI loop is the dionized water or liquid loop. Um, and all around this is in principle, is in principle support, if you want to call it. And um, and uh, what is required to manage all the operations in the, in the stack and balance of stack core system itself, so to speak. I want to also use this a little to what we, what we do as Elikid. So we, in principle, uh, from Elikid and EMC point of view, from an engineering point of view, we manage all the blue boxes, very typically speaking, uh, can always be discussed, depends project on project, but usually we manage the blue boxes and whoever provides the, whoever the technology or partner or vendor supplies the core, is usually as a package unit and we would integrate it and manage them the whole installation. So here some, some uh, let's start with some figures also where we see the difference. So the alkaline is uh, in the middle now, uh, the pen on the left. And on the right side is a very new concept. We call it a uh, SOEC. And here also we have an, an oxide anion as an energy carrier. Um, this has certain advantages and the biggest one is it runs at higher temperature uh, by quite far compared to the today's options. And um, this is what makes it inherently more efficient. But uh, this is not yet in industrial, um, let's say, reference. So it's more pilot testing stage. Um, and um, hence for this presentation today, I want to focus a little on PEM type and on alkaline type. Um, and also we will see we have two subtypes of this. So alkaline and PEM again, and I use the same pictures. Very quickly some pros and cons. So alkaline is, is, as I said, it's an older, it's old techno, it's mature. It has a nice scalability. Um, we have six stacks are, are possible. It's very cost effective. Um, um, it uses, let's say, relatively normal materials. Um, with the KOH, you have your, catalyt uh, we have your catalytic effect ongoing. And it's a very proven lifetime. Yeah? Since it has a very long history, it's no problem to have very, uh, reference situation lifetimes are proven in, in thousands of hours and um, that's that's very very long let's see on the more new side you have to them um, you have uh, it's clearly more compact as we see it as we've seen before so in the in the photographs and that's one of the big advantages it has no koh which is easy and handling yeah? so you don't need to deal with koh I and mean, koh is also a it's a very strong base it has it's, it's irritating it needs special chemical handling um, so that's clearly a disadvantage on the alkaline side. Um, uh, it has a faster reactivity because everything is more compact. So the, 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 the current itself, you have less volume, it can react quicker to changes in the, in the power grid. And it works at high pressure. No? So and that's clearly a big advantage in more and more applications that we can produce hydrogen directly at high pressure without further compressing. There's a way in the middle, uh, at least as of, as of today, and this is a pressurization of the alkaline system. And that's what we call alkaline pressurized. So it mirrors a little left and, left and right side. Uh, so it's still mature, um, cost effective, but you also can run it at higher pressure. And that's what we see also more and more these days at uh, interest for, for pressurized alkaline ones. And that's also one reason why alkaline is clearly, uh, um, let's say, subject of further research also. So it's not by far not bad. Good. 
give you some figures where we stand. Uh, this is very typical figures, and it, I would say for this accuracy here, it's relatively independent which kind of techno um, you use. Uh, of course, you have some differences when it comes to it. So I would I would say the rule of thumb is for five kilowatt hours, you make one normal cubes of uh, hydrogen. So I'm sorry here, I'm using the normal cubes. <laughs> um, um, and if you if you if you look at uh, and and Manish made a similar uh, gave a similar slides uh, in his presentation, it's clear that of course we are far away from very big large SMR plants no, with these kind of installations. So the project sizes we see today, a few megawatts, uh, is far away from a real industrial use. So the whole idea of this is of course to make all of this um, compactor, cheaper. To really to produce uh, tens of thousands of normal cubes, maybe hundreds of thousands of normal cubes, gigawatt range, as we as this, where we go then quickly um, in the next ten years uh, or even further, and that's really the idea. Otherwise, this whole thing, the, the competitiveness of the of the hydrogen produced here, probably will not contribute in the way we have seen it in the beginning. So we really the whole industry and LED is clearly part of it, and we want to be part of it. Has to has to push here into drastic reduction of the total cost of ownership of the hydrogen produced. So to give us some idea where we stand today, and this is also in, uh, from the from the International uh, Energy Agency, uh, so you can look it up. We have made a nice report, the future of hydrogen. It's called. It's really it's really quite nice. And this is where it is extracted from, and you see where we stand today. Huh? So a typical KPI we are using is US dollars per kilowatt electric produced. And we are around 1,000. Uh, so you, so it's, it, this translates to 1 million per 1 megawatt. And that's where we currently operate. On the PEM, it's a little higher. That's why I said alkaline is more cost effective today. But if you look at the trajectory, 10 years and long term, they come closer. Uh, they have different, let's say, uh, angles, how they go down, but they clearly, they clearly will go down. And the idea is, and you see it, you see it here, roughly to half, to half this, this figure, in both the in both the technos, um, to to really cut down the cost of hydrogen produced. I was talking about footprint earlier to give you some perspective. Today, and that's what you see here, uh, for 100 megawatt installation, for alkaline we have around 3,000 uh, square meter, for PEM, let's say two thirds of it. And the balance of plant is then whatever is around it, as we've seen it earlier, which we can argue is relatively independent of the techno used. Not completely, but in, for this exercise, we can say it's independent. And the trend here really also to have this down. No? So the, the whole idea is to go down with the capex, go down with the footprint. Footprint is enormous. No? 100 megawatt, as we have seen earlier, is really not much compared to today's installations with SMR. So we really have to go down. And, uh, and how do we do that? The idea is here, for example, we have 20, 20 uh, stacks or 20 uh, trains of, of, of stacks to compact it. No? So the stacks get bigger and the clusters get larger. Uh, and with this, we can compact the whole the footprint. And that's clearly one lever um, to, to move down on the capex itself by the scale of the, of the, of the stack itself and also by the reduction of the footprint. So to summarize a little, I think where, where the industry needs to go, um, project sizes, uh, it's currently around 20 to 100 megawatts. As we said, it's, it's very large for electrolyzer perspective, but for traditional production of hydrogen, it's not at all large. Uh, we said capex around, uh, we said uh, yeah, one to two million in very high range for one megawatt, footprint two to 3,000. Specific power now for one normal cube is around five kilowatt hour, and as you said, and cost of hydrogen. And I made an X here. I come to it. What 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 determines it? So where do we where do we want or where we think we need to go? We have several effects. Projects will get size. Uh, will project size will get bigger. We will see scale effect purely by by procurement effect, scaling effect. Um, um, demand will get bigger. Uh, capex will go down by techno steps uh, by compacting by reduction of footprint, as we said, usually by half, we can say half in capex, half in footprint. Specific power will not have such a trajectory, uh, so we will not see going down by half because the efficiency today is not so bad in terms of what's theoretically possible. We will see some reduction 
you will see more current densities. So PEM, for example, can take more current in the same area, which contributes to this as well. So the overall idea is to halve the cost of production of hydrogen by these measures in the next 10 years. Um, and I think that's also where, where if you look at the Hydrogen Council paper, McKinsey paper made a report on this, where it needs to go. Otherwise, the electrolysis uh, cannot play the role it actually should play. So what's now the cost of hydrogen, you might ask? And of course, it very much depends on what's the cost of power you put in. Uh, the cost of power you put in is uh, contributing roughly two thirds to the overall cost of hydrogen. Um, today, we can say we, if you take 40, 40 to 50 uh, USD per megawatt uh, kilogram price for hydrogen, it's probably in the range of four, five, six, seven, nine right, in this range. And if you half it down, you would reach two, three, four. So that's, that's the ranges we are talking about. Um, but it's, it's very, uh, I did not put the number on purpose because it very much depends on cost of green power. So the whole, the whole thing, of course, is very much driven uh, or leveraged also if the cost of the power goes down in parallel. Um, and that's one, one message. Uh, so what do we use it for? Um, electrolysis is very clear, needs to be integrated. We can use it for with renewable power. That's clearly the idea. So it can also serve the grid in terms of base loading. Uh, it can serve the grid in terms of taking intermediate load from wind and solar. And we have a lot of outlets, no? steel, industry, steel industry, chemical outlets combined with CO2 for further chemical production, uh, classic hydrogen, and uh, of course also mobility, heat integration. Let's not forget oxygen. I did not talk about it too much today, but it's still something also we need to look into. So um, I just want to introduce two projects Ali Keat has, um, has um, done recently. One is a, is a cooperation uh, with several partners in Europe that's, a high, that's called High Balance. And that's a PEM type 1.25 with Hydrogenics. It's a Canadian company where, uh, disclaimer, Ali Keat has a minority stake and, and the majority is held by Cummins Incorporated. And, um, and you see here again, uh, the electrolyzer is, re is relatively small. That's 1.25 and you can roughly guess the size here. Uh, and you have a lot of, uh, of, of filling, storage, electric substation, just to give a perspective where we stand. And this is an operating loss in a few years. And in addition, also we are proud that we have um, proud to announce and we have announced already uh, an own investment in the largest PEM um, electrolyzer project, 20 megawatts, uh, also with hydrogenics in Canada. This is our own investment. We will own and operate it. Um, and it's uh, currently construction phase. And uh, it's, it's a very nice project. And you see here, that's a small sketch. It goes in four trains, uh, four trains of stacks, uh, four stacks each. Uh, and, uh, and again, you see here some idea on the footprint and the brown one is the electrical rectifier section. And you have on the top right, the the balance of plants section and cooling and, and, and gas management. So this is, um, this is also, uh, as I said, one of the, one of the examples uh, of, elect of electrolyzer investment by LEQ. It's not the first one. Uh, we have operation uh, of around 35 plus electrolyzers worldwide currently, but very small scale. Let's say less than one megawatt. So this is really one, the first really industrial one, 20 megawatts, big size. And one. So I come to the closing main takeaways. So electrolysis is a direct way from green power to green hydrogen. Yeah? So no carbon capture uh, in between. Uh, we believe it plays already, well, definitely will play a significant role in the, for the industry to decarbonize. It's an interesting situation with reference technology. So operators, people, investors can have some bankability. At the same time, we see quite a good push to new technos and new concepts uh, in terms of reducing of course, the TCO, as I said, uh, red, reduction of cost is the main challenge for the next years. So um, volume effect will play a role, scale effect will play a role. Uh, lifetime efficiency will improve. Lifetime is very important, especially for the new technologies. Integration of electrical systems, balance of grid, and this can also have a value for the operator. And of course, ongoing R&D on the emerging technologies. So Aliquid is ready for this. Uh, we, as, as, we, as I have shown, we have uh, invested, we, we will operate. We also prepare ourselves for the upcoming trends. And we do this with quite a big uh, program and it ranges from RIT 
to TechnoWatch, uh, dedicated product management, uh, operations of plants, uh, of course, a dedicated engineering team. And um, with this, um, we, we are quite confident that we will have good solutions for you, uh, for customers in the now and in the next 10 years to help to decarbonize uh, your processes. With this, I close. Thank you very much. Um, any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you. All right, thank you, Alexander. So with that, we will move on to our last presentation. Stuart Stewart, if you could uh, go ahead and share your screen and take it away. There we go. Um, hope everybody can see that now. Um, Zane, Anna, Chris, thanks so much for the opportunity to present today to AIST. Uh, pleasure to join Minish and Alexander today uh, and talk to you about opportunities for decarbonizing the iron and steel making sectors. I think if we had done this presentation maybe a year ago, um, we probably would have just worried about the world burning uh, and reaching the apocalypse due to climate change. And now we're all faced with a host of other challenges. So I hope everybody is safe and well during these uncertain times. Aotech is an on-site uh, hydrogen production company. We make uh, equipment, modular steam methane reformers, uh, that help the world basically take control of hydrogen supply in a low cost and low carbon cost efficient manner. Um, we do that by deploying our units basically in the uh, configuration you see there, about a 40 foot container. Uh, we deploy these units on site so that you can take advantage of low cost natural gas or biomethane supplies delivered by the multi-trillion dollar network of gas pipelines around the world today. Um, we achieve low cost and low carbon efficiency um, through uh, high internal heat recuperation and energy efficiency within our unit. We don't rely upon uh, exported steam or exported heat to subsidize out of the economics, the energy efficiency of our units. Uh, those things combined uh, with the elimination of transportation and need for liquefaction by being an on-site production technology allows you to result in a low cost and low carbon hydrogen supply solution. We do that in a pretty flexible manner. Um, our units start at a quite small scale of 200 kilograms per day, uh, up to one metric ton per day. Uh, and beginning next year, we'll have larger units five and 10 times that size. And in fact, going up even to the 30 ton per day size. Um, end of next year as well, we're targeting uh, on-site ammonia production as well from that on-site hydrogen. We try to do this in a very flexible way by giving folks uh, opportunities to um, step gently into the hydrogen transition or energy transition through on-site hydrogen by offering uh, not just equipment sales, but also leases and rentals. Um, we really do strive at Biotech to offer a solution to the world um, to be that sort of a low cost first step onto the energy transition as you look at ways to decarbonize through hydrogen. I won't dwell on the SMR technology overview. Manish did a great job of laying out the actual uh, both chemistry of it and plant design. Um, suffice to say that a biotech on-site unit uh, does much the same process and flows basically um, that you would see in a large scale um, SMR plant, um, but just done on a much more small basis. Um, one note about miniaturization, when most technologies that were developed for large scale uh, steam method and reformer plants um, that get very efficient as they get larger and larger, um, when you try to miniaturize those technologies, they often don't achieve the same level of efficiency um, for heat and material and pressure reasons. Um, by contrast, the biotech technology was designed uh, to optimize at a small scale, um, high temperature, low pressure reactions, which was ideally suited to incorporation into the SMR. Um, so through our SMR technology, which is based on what we call a nested tube or a nested flow reactor, uh, we basically make very high internal use of the heat that is generated by our process. Um, such that we don't have to export um, heat to achieve efficiency. Uh, as I mentioned, we take all this and we do that in a small form factor. We do it into a 40 foot container uh, plus two additional skids. Um, the equipment that you see in the 40 foot container is all biotech specific equipment, whereas we rely upon outside vendors for two key pieces of equipment at the front end and the back end. The desulfurization unit that you see here on the bottom left, and then the pressure swing absorption unit that we uh, source through a company called Zebec. Uh, to achieve uh, high purity hydrogen. 
There's really, um, the list of equipment is similar to what you would see at a big plant, again, other than a slight difference in the deliver of the SMR tubes themselves and how the reaction takes place on site in a small form factor. Um, by being this small, there's a couple advantages. One, uh, the product is really, I should say, the, the SMR is really productized. Uh, it's installation ready um, with minimal customization uh, for deployment on site. And therefore you can have them actually shipped and delivered within six months. Uh, and really have installation commissioning time as short as two weeks. Um, so when we take this technology, one of the things we need to get into a little bit is understanding what the um, energy that you're using is, what you're producing from it, and what the waste products are associated with it. Um, so I'm going to focus on what is uh, the one ton per day throughput unit. Again, we have units planned for next year at 5, 10, and even 30 times the scale as I go through these numbers. So for the on-site uh, reformer, uh, starting with 188 MMBTU of natural gas or biomethane on the front end. Um, put that through your steam reformer. And on the back end, produce your hydrogen. Um, that comes out of the PSA reactor. It can be produced at up to 99.999 or five nines for hydrogen transportation needs or fuel cell needs. Um, and produce uh, anywhere from one ton per day, as you see there, or for our European colleagues, um, 463. 464 normal meters cubed per hour of more or less pure hydrogen. Um, along with that, of course, the, the thing we're trying to focus on here is decarbonization and opportunities for iron and steel making. Um, generally, depending on the efficiencies of the unit, some of the things associated with feedstock and also how hard you push your PSA, uh, each ton of hydrogen that you produce is going to yield about 9 to 11 uh, times that amount um, in terms of CO2 production. So when we think about on-site technology, this is really what Biotech is driven after, is what are the opportunities to improve this total picture, both for a cost and uh, decarbonization strategy standpoint. We really focused on four opportunities. The first is, again, uh, just to reiterate, by be a virtue of being on-site, you get a couple of improvements. One is um, you eliminate the need for transportation and transportation-related emissions associated with it. You also avoid uh, what is typical of a lot of um, delivery or transport these days, which is liquefaction or the demand for liquefaction. Hydrogen doesn't transport easily, so for large-scale deliveries and for cost efficiency reasons, we um, tend to layer on top of that liquefaction as a means of delivering it more economically. That, of course, has a huge energy burden associated with it and the carbon load that comes with it at the same time. Second opportunity uh, is to focus on efficiency of the production process and efficiency of the harvesting of the hydrogen from it. Um, Biotech's nested flow technology um, does achieve very high uh, internal energy efficiency, as I said, and gets us a good yield that really minimizes the amount of energy that you put into the furnace. At the end of the day, you can't, um, there's not really any gain to be achieved through the amount of hydrogen, or excuse me, natural gas or methane flowing through the reactor itself. Rather, the, the efficiency point is how much additional energy is required to be put into the furnace up front and what's the source of that. When we talk about the source, obviously the, the original or origins of, of steam methane reformation is based on um, reforming of natural gas. So of course, the further opportunity to include your car improve your carbon footprint, pardon me, is to switch over to biomethane. So we're really gonna drill into that in a minute. Finally, of course, other speakers have spoken to the opportunity for on-site carbon capture as well. Um, really, within the process like this, there's two opportunities for capturing uh, carbon off the process. You could either take it directly from the tail gas, um, where you would have a higher concentration but lower volume of CO2 being produced, or you can take that from the stack because tail gas is pushed back through the furnace as well. So you'll have a higher amount of CO2 coming out of the, the thermal stack, uh, but at the end of the day, a lower concentration because of the nitrogen going through it as well. These are four areas that Biotech has really tried to, to dial in uh, and achieve greater efficiency for decarbonization purposes so that we can be that low cost first step on the decarbonization pathway for energy transition. Um, I want to focus today though, given the topic uh, that we've looked at on the biogas and biomethane opportunity. So I'm going to divert for a minute to dive in there. Um, for those who are a little bit less familiar with biogas and biomethane, um, biogas is uh, the gas that is derived from the biological decomposition of organic matter in the absence of oxygen. That's the anaerobic part of anaerobic digestion. Um, sources for that gas come from many different organic materials. Um, we have it being generated in landfills. Um, you can get it from animal waste, food waste, 
crop residues, uh, even purpose-built crops, even though that's not necessarily the appropriate way to go with land use impacts, uh, and also from wastewater treatment use, and uh, wastewater treatment sludges that are you know, derived from the process. Um, biogas generally um, is predominantly methane, CH4, uh, anywhere from call it 50% to 70%, depends on the source and the process. The main um, additional constituent in there is the generation of CO2 as an off-gas, again, 30 to 40% roughly. And then largely you'll have the balance made up by sulfur compounds like hydrogen sulfide, some ammonia, in some cases, depending on the waste source, siloxanes, which is a complicated waste material to extract and deal with, uh, and some water vapor. Um, so what do we do with biogas? Biogas itself, because of that high CO2 concentration, um, isn't necessarily ready for many applications. It can be combusted directly. Um, again, you collect that from either an anaerobic digester that's purpose built. That's the type of unit that you see in the right corner. Um, it's also generated automatically through landfills and can be collected from landfill gas. Uh, or you have purpose built manure lagoons where you can capture directly um, methane releases from animal operations. So those gases, um, as I said, can be combusted directly. Uh, they can be generated uh, generating heat and power and combined heat and power units uh, or put into reciprocating engines. The more valuable pathway and certainly gives us a lot more options is when you take that biogas and you treat it or upgrade it. Um, generally, there's three primary steps in the upgrading process. Uh, you want to dry it or dewater it. You want to remove impurities such as hydrogen sulfide and siloxanes. And then finally, for a lot of applications, you want to separate out the CO2 to create better efficiency or a greater variety of end uses that you could use that uh, biogas or now biomethane in. So the net uh, product of all that activity is to create a biomethane, which is more or less equivalent to what you would get from pipeline natural gas. Uh, when you get to that, um, many people call it renewable natural gas uh, or biomethane. Um, the uses for it are myriad. Uh, it can be used directly in transportation-related applications, such as uh, CNG engines or LNG applications. Um, in many cases, it's injected into the grid for purposes of uh, further or distant use. That allows people to trade uh, and take book and claim credit for natural gas and the improvements uh, that come from sourcing it from a biomethane source. Finally, obviously, in the case of our hydrogen uh, SMR project, uh, it can be a feedstock, both a feedstock for us or a feedstock in chemical processes or, or feedstock even to the iron and steel industry. So what do we do with that? How does that get applied? Obviously, you can take that entire value chain um, and go from waste through biogas, upgrade that to biomethane, either distribute that through the pipeline, uh, like we were talking about, where you're talking about a directed biogas, or a book and claim um, type transaction. Because um, basically the molecule at one end is the same as the molecule at the other end. You feed that into your on-site SMR process and the result is now a green or renewable hydrogen. And that's without even going through the additional steps that we talked about that are possible for future CO2 capture. In either of these pathways, you can either significantly reduce the carbon footprint associated with hydrogen generation and hydrogen supply, or even potentially go negative. Let's pause for a minute and talk about sustainability attributes of hydrogen in general. Um, there's two things we tend to talk about in the world of hydrogen. Um, the first is renewable. Um, folks, you've seen the, the references to gray, blue, and green hydrogen in some cases. Other folks merely focus on the renewable qualities of it. In California, as a fuel market, for example, we require uh, initially that, that hydrogen must be a third renewable content, and that's going up over time. Um, when you talk about renewable uh, nature of hydrogen, you're generally characterizing the source of the molecule or where it's derived from. Um, in terms of methane-derived technologies, that means that the original molecule, the biogas, is coming from a biogenic source. Again, landfill, animal waste, wastewater treatment plants, and so on. In terms of electrical, electrolytic uh, hydrogen produced by electrolysis, that means that the, the power that you're relying upon for the production process is from a renewable source. Um, it doesn't have to come from the renewable source. It could, of course, come from the grid, which would make it not renewable. Um, generally, when we talk about renewable hydrogen, of course, this means that um, you're generally ignoring, in most of these conversations, believe it or not, uh, the additional energy related to either processing the material after it's done, or in some cases, gathering the feedstock associated with that. So when you look at many markets and talk about renewable hydrogen, it doesn't necessarily have to have been compressed or liquefied, for example, using renewable power. So it just depends market to market what folks are referring to and how that's defined. Carbon intensity, by contrast, 
is really a factor of both the feedstock uh, and the processing. So the goal in carbon intensity measures is to reflect the entire value chain and the energy inputs into it. Um, that includes the front end in terms of the gas sourcing or uh, other material, as well as the energy used for production, and finally the energy used for delivering or using that to the market. I think for purposes of this audience today, that's probably the more relevant thing to focus on um, for use in iron steel. So a quick look um, at the carbon intensity of hydrogen production. And I'm gonna start first with fossil sources. Here I've used not uh, company or technology specific information, but rather gone with generic figures based on CARB, the California Air Resources Board methodology for how they assign or score carbon intensity by source. Um, depending on your geography and what regulatory scheme or market you're trying to serve, of course, the method of carbon accounting will differ, um, but this is one good baseline uh, that has been widely vetted. So let's take a look at it quickly. Um, interesting thing is when you start off with non-renewable um, power, so in this case, California grid standard electricity with only a percentage of renewables, and you feed that into an electrolyzer, um, CARB scores that at a 164 grams of CO2 equivalent um, per megajoule of energy produced. Um, so it's actually quite high and it's driven by that inefficient drive of, of uh, power from you know, a carbon intensive or fossil driven grid uh, source of power on average. Then if we take a look at the uh, central SMR or onsite SMR from natural gas sources or fossil sources, um, there's really two drivers that come into play here, assuming similar efficiency ratios. Um, the main drivers in this case are if you look at central SMR, um, are you going to liquefy it or are you going to deliver it as gas? Liquefaction has such a high energy demand associated with it, in this case, that it adds up to 45 grams of CO2 equivalent per megajoule of energy delivered. Um, whereas transportation and compression um, are much lower. Compression generally, if you're going to do gas delivery, and then delivery of, of tube trailers and so on is around seven. Um, the net of all that is that if you do on site SMR, you have a lower starting carbon footprint irrespective of. of feedstock. Um, so let's move over then to the renewable hydrogen sources or renewable sources of uh, feedstock. So the first layer there we're adding in is if you take a centralized SMR using liquid and you add landfill gas to it, it tends to improve by about um, 20 points or grams per megajoule. Um, those are similar yields or improvements that you can get by doing that on-site or centrally. So the same sort of similar ratios apply for on-site versus centralized production using landfill gas. Um, landfill gas generally is, in most accounting systems, viewed as um, sort of the higher um, carbon intensity biogas source. Um, you have a range of sources and a range of uh, impacts from them. Generally, that tends to go from biomethane um, generated by landfill gas, uh, and secondly, generated in anaerobic digesters or wastewater treatment plants, and finally, manure-based projects uh, tend to be the most negative uh, in this case, you can see it's going all the way down to negative 300 in terms of its carbon intensity score. All those line up fairly well, and you can see sort of um, the range of possibilities, therefore, that straddle um, a electrolysis-based project using strictly wind or solar. Um, again, the difference between the 56 and 11 that you see associated with the wind and solar electrolysis-based projects is whether or not you're looking for and delivering versus doing it on site yourself with renewable power. So it's important to understand the range of outcomes and, and where one can get onto the carbon intensity scale based on feedstock. Um, uh, I can certainly share the math on that. You'll find in the presentation, for those you wanna take a look at it later, there's an additional slide that has that math behind it that gives you the data in order to look into those numbers and see where they come from from CARB. Um, but generally, I think that's one of the key takeaways when we look at this is, um, as you look at carbon solutions and the goal of decarbonizing uh, iron making and steel making through hydrogen based opportunities, um, it's key to consider what the source of the hydrogen is, how that plays into the carbon intensity, and what the cost of those resources are, and what the impact will be on the overall um, cost of production for the end product that you're trying to make. Um, on site SMR is an attractive alternative in a lot of cases because it gives you that opportunity to control both the carbon intensity um, by changing your feedstock. Um, as well as the cost. When we think about sort of long run, how these things all fit together, um, because you have cost advantages by being on site, sometimes on site technologies can be as much as two or three times as uh, less expensive than centralized produced hydrogen that is delivered. 
that gives you a lot of flexibility, both in terms of um, paying, paying additional amounts for bio-renewable feedstocks uh, or adding on carbon capture technologies. If you think generally about sort of um, looking farther into the future and how we might go further negative through carbon capture, um, generally carbon capture technologies, if you think about them somewhere in the range of uh, $100 per ton of CO2 capture being used, um, per $100, in the grand scheme of things, that's going to add about a dollar per kilogram to the cost of produced hydrogen on site. Um, so given cost advantages, that's really an affordable um, cost in many cases that can be competitive with other sources of energy. Um, happy to, uh, at this point, step back, share the stage, and uh, give a chance to answer any questions uh, both here or for the panel. Thank, right. Thank you very much. I'll, uh, sorry, Dr. Pistorius, I'll, I'll hand it off to you. Excellent. Thank you very much uh, to our speakers uh, for providing a, a range of perspectives. Um, um, we'll take some time for questions. Um, we'll say use about 15 minutes for that. Thank you for our audience for, for staying with us. I'll start with uh, Manish, please. Um, we had um, a range of questions um, talking about the similar issues around the, the safety around hydrogen, and in particular, the materials of, of construction. So if, if uh, hydrogen becomes more pervasive as, a, as an energy source and a reductant, um, how different are the materials requirements for hydrogen pipelines, say, compared with a conventional natural gas pipeline? Well, I'm not a materials expert, so unfortunately, I cannot... Uh comment on the differences uh, between the materials, but this is a mature technology. We've been running this hydrogen pipeline for a long time. Uh, you know, we, we have solved the materials pro problem. You know, we, we have materials experts who design, make sure there are no embrittlement issues. Uh, I think in a hydrogen plant itself, depending on the temperature pressure that we have, uh, we have different materials, uh, obviously, uh, to make sure that uh, our plants are safe and reliable. But I think that's a general answer I can give, but I don't have any specifics on the materials. Okay, thank you very much. Um, um, again, uh, we had a number of questions on a similar um, set of topics, which I'll pose to Alexander, please, um, which is um, to talk a little bit about the requirements of the water used in, in electrolysis. Um, you know, can one use seawater or river water? What, what are the purity requirements? No, so the, the water needs to be at human water quality at least. Yeah? So the water quality specs are quite stringent. Yeah? I mean, the, the, the material of the stacks, of the catalysts, of the membranes, it's quite sensitive and uh, every contamination, of course, is detrimental to the lifetime. So the overall idea is to, of course, keep the lifetime as, as long as possible. Um, from that point of view, we need clean water. Um, of course, uh, the source of the water is an interesting question. And I think people start to look into it only now with more interest, especially usage of seawater. You need some desalination, desalination step up front, of course. What's the cost impact? Is it a feasible option to do it with seawater from that point of view? Um, I think we, we tried, we are in the beginning to try to understand here the impacts, uh, whether it's a much, much of a cost driver or not. Um, so far, I, I would argue it has a little bit neglected, I would say, but it's clearly a question which comes more and more on the table. So absolutely, very good question. Thank you very much. Um, and then one for, uh, for Stuart, um, you showed that, uh, that useful summary of the different costs with, with the different uh, technology options. Um, what in your view is the, is the pathway um, as we go from steam methane reforming, which is order of magnitude 10 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of hydrogen to fully green hydrogen? What would you see as the, as the main drivers which would get us there um, at scale and cost competitive? And, and what are the technological steps that you see along the way? Yeah, from, from 30 years in the energy industry in general, I think that um, if history has taught us anything, it's that a diversity of supply in the energy industry is uh, both critical, both from a um, stability and security of supply, as well as cost stability over a long term. 
Um, we tend to view the hydrogen role in an energy transition um, as being one that will evolve over time. 95% of the world's hydrogen today is produced by steam methane reformation. Uh, we do expect that to go down over time as competing technologies become more cost effective uh, and can produce at higher volumes that the world requires. There's a real daunting challenge though if you think about the role of hydrogen in decarbonizing the economy and if you were strictly going to focus for example on an electrolysis based approach. Um, we, we, are, we are not uh, in a world right now that is uh, views um, renewable power as a non-competitive resource. There's lots of demand for that power today. Uh, and the better opportunity for renewable power immediately is um, for other applications other than you know, heavy duty mobility and industrial carbon and industrial sectors and heat. Um, those are sort of the last things that we would get around to electrifying. Therefore, steam reformation, steam methane reformation or other sources of reformation basically are gonna be a gas that is going to be used to help drive this transition over time and through either carbon capture or biogas, biomethane-based opportunities, there's real opportunities to um, take positive steps to decarbonization today that don't have to wait for a much more developed and advanced grid. Uh, you can start decarbonizing today in marginal incremental steps, and we'll see if that takes five years or 30 years to get there. Excellent, thank you. Um, then um, some more detailed questions, um, one for Manish. Uh, in, in your examples of, of existing plants that um, use carbon capture as, as an, another part of decarbonizing our industry, uh, you showed a DRI plant that uses pressure swing absorption. Can you comment on where this plant is? Uh, what's, what's the scale of, of the carbon capture that is employed? Uh, so this plant is in India. I don't know the specific uh, steel mill uh, or the iron making facility where it's used. Uh, obviously, we can share that detail uh, if uh, interested, uh, you know, through my colleagues. Uh, in the pressure swing adsorption, uh, and uh, I think volume of CO2 would be, uh, I guess, uh, you know, it's a 500,000 meter cube of the product gas. So if you have to back calculate and then calculate how much CO2 was in the feed gas, uh, that was separated. I, I don't remember exactly, is the top gas that you recycle, is it more like 20% CO2 or is it even higher? Uh, do you know? Yes, it, uh, it, depending on, on the inlet gas stream. Um, so the processes differ a little bit in terms of the CO to hydrogen ratio in, in the input, but yeah, it can be of that order. Yep. Oh, okay. So I think if you back calculate, then it gives, tells you how much it may be on the order of 100,000 meter cube per hour of CO2 separated. I saw another question related to that, you know, what is the purge gas requirement? The driving force really is the pressure swing, so we don't need any purge gas. In fact, that's the advantage of PSA versus amine technology, that you don't need any uh, thermal energy to drive the separation. You do need a pressure available so that you drive the separation through pressure swing. So your adsorption pressure uh, usually would be higher. And when you purge those adsorbent beds, uh, you lower the pressure and release the CO2 from adsorbents and you recover that uh, CO2 rich stream that way. Okay, thank you very much. Um, then um, for uh, Alexander again, um, you gave us a a nice uh, one slide summary of some of the, the safety concerns, uh, which of course are considerable. We all have the, the Hindenburg picture in the back of our mind when we hear hydrogen, although the flames I believe was from the aluminum skin of the other plane because uh, hydrogen doesn't burn like that. Um, but um, as one thinks about scaling this up and rolling this out onto the scale one would need for iron making, which which is large, uh, you know, it's if we produced maybe 20% of the, of the steel production in the US from hydrogen, that's, that's about 10% of the, of the current hydrogen production in, in the US. Um, so, so these would be large operations. Um, um, is there anything specific about application of electrolysis that, that changes the, the safety picture 
and maybe something else different about the the scale one would need for an actual iron making operation. Yeah, so on a, on a scale of the pure hydrogen, I think we are well, very well in reference territory um, because hydrogen is produced and, and we are also producing it via SMR today, which produces large amounts of concentrated hydrogen. So all the safety measures around that is very well known. And I come back to the earlier discussion on the material of construction, uh, hydrogen stressed uh, corrosion, uh, with, which SMR may be also uh, Metal dusting, so all this is understood and can be and can can be controlled by various means of selection of materials and also uh, process control. Uh, so from that point of view, I would say that's not specific to an electrolysis uh, per se, also not with a scale point of view. I think what makes a difference in electrolysis is that at the same time, potentially at the same location, uh, actually at the same location, you produce also oxygen. And, and as we know, oxygen, hydrogen is a quite explosive mixture. And uh, that needs to be taken care of. So there needs to be a quite a good uh, detection system outside in the plant, but also from a process control point of view to detect immediately pressure differences between the two systems and uh, shut down. And uh, I would say in addition for the electrolysis, especially if it's alkaline, is the hazards around the management of the chemical of the electrolyte. So that's also something where one needs to look at in terms of uh, also protection of the operators who are in the field. Um, I would say that's more the specifics on the electrolyzer, not so much the scale of the hydrogen production, because I would argue that's referenced also with Aston. Excellent. Thank you very much. And I think given the time, just one closing question to, to Stuart, please. Um, now to produce a, a ton of iron out of iron ore using hydrogen that takes about 50 kilograms of of hydrogen uh, so to to produce significant amounts of iron uh, one does need large scale production um, your technology is is really focused on these um, nicely modularized units that you can deploy quite rapidly um, what would you think is the applicability of that in, in say, a steel plant where one can use hydrogen for heating, um, which would typically use lower volumes than, than in an iron making plant where you really need a lot of it? What, what would be some of the advantages of, of using hydrogen in that kind of lower volume application instead of natural gas or maybe even burning the, the biogas uh, directly? Again, you'll have to come up with, um, you know, the pathway that actually results in a lower carbon footprint than strictly burning the fuel directly. Uh, so there has to be some advantage gained by going through the effort and the expense of getting the hydrogen in order for that to be worthwhile to um, have an improvement on decarbonization. Um, opportunities exist, for example, in the transportation space, not just because of um, there being no pollution at the end point from the emissions process, but also you have the greater efficiency of the fuel cell relative to the internal combustion engine that helps accelerate that usage and the decarbonization advantages associated with it. In heat-based processes, your advantages is really going to be derived from some combination of the feedstock or carbon capture. Um, with respect to a scale standpoint, right, our largest units planned for future are really um, targeted at 30 tons per day as being a good fit with on-site ammonia production, because that's really around the scale at which on-site ammonia production becomes um, feasible and economical to get you out of business of transporting ammonia, which is um, expensive and, and uh, dangerous to move as well. Um, so I think there are plenty of applications um, uh, from a heat standpoint, um, from a reductant gas supply standpoint um, for on-site hydrogen to compete. But realistically, those carbon advantages have to be delivered either from a feedstock perspective or ultimately long-term through carbon capture. Excellent. Thank you very much. And thank you again to, to all our speakers uh, for, for sharing your, your perspectives. Uh, to the um, audience, um, please feel free to contact our presenters. If you have follow-up questions, obviously we couldn't go into uh, everything that, that the audience wished to know. Um, and uh, the uh, meeting of today, the, the webinar has been recorded and this will be available on the IISD website uh, shortly. Um, please stay posted. There will be a follow-up um, 
to these uh, to the series of presentations, which will be about usage of the low carbon direct reduced iron, which is what one will produce uh, if you if you start using um, hydrogen instead of um, natural gas in production of of DRI. So thank you again to our speakers and to our audience. And with that, I'll hand back to to Anna for any closing comments. Yeah, I just had one other thing I wanted to mention that again, this event was organized by the uh, AIST DRI committee. Um, and we do have unrelated to the DRI technology committee, we do have a number of upcoming webinars through AIST. Uh, today, this afternoon, we actually have a webinar focused on lubrication and hydraulics. And then tomorrow we have another uh, webinar on digital transformation, particularly how AI is increasing production quality in steel manufacturing. Uh, beyond those two, we have lots of webinars in the pipeline. Uh, check them all out at AIST.org. And I will say thank you all for attending again. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.